there we go. And now I'll introduce Bob Cornell, who is the president of our NAMI affiliate. Bob, please. All right, well, thank you, Susie. Um, hello and uh, welcome everyone. Of course, this event is brought to you by your local affiliate of the National Alliance on Mental Illness, and we serve Lower Fairfield County. Uh, we're a nonprofit organization dedicated to improving the quality of life for individuals and families living with a mental health condition. To that end, I'd just like to remind everyone of our free services. We offer two types of confidential support groups, um, friends and family, which is for family members of adults, and NAMI CAN for parents and caregivers of children and adolescents. We also offer free evidence-based classes. Uh, there's a family to family, uh, an education program for family and friends of adults again, and NAMI basics for family of children. By the way, if anyone is interested, our next family to family class starts in just a few weeks on March 11th at the Greenwich Hospital. It'll be an in-person event rather than Zoom. So we'll meet once a week for eight weeks. We have an ongoing speaker series like the one tonight um, and a book club that meets every other month on Zoom. Our next book selection is Maybe You Should Talk to Someone by Laura Gottlieb, uh, a best-selling book that we will discuss on Monday, March 20th. So I encourage you to please uh, visit our website at nammysouthwestct.org for more information about us and how to register for any of these uh, upcoming events. I also encourage you to join NAMI. So now let me uh, introduce uh, Dr. Leitman, who will be speaking to us tonight. Dr. Leitman is a progressive internist who specializes in optimizing clozapine. He's on the board of directors of the Schizophrenia and Psychosis Action Alliance. Uh, he's a published author, and he and his wife, Dr. Ann Mendel, established the nonprofit organization Team Daniel in 2010. So thank you, Dr. Leitman. Uh, we are very glad that you're here. And with that, I'll turn the event over to you. Thank you. And also, I'm a big supporter of NAMI and was six years on the Westchester board and six years on the state board as well. Wow. So this is a topic obviously near and dear to my heart and optimal treatment of psychotic disorders does involve clozapine, does involve engagement and absolutely in the spirit of NAMI does involve a community. Next slide, please. So our journey really began 17 years ago when my son, Daniel, uh, developed uh, schizophrenia. Um, and again, I was incredibly upset and stymied and amazed at how poor the care was for people with severe psychotic disorders. It was clearly uh, uh, the case that Daniel had a very resistant form of uh, psychosis, and he went on to fail five different antipsychotics. Fortunately, my wife and I were very lucky that we were both physicians, and we started to read, and we read voraciously, and it became really apparent to us after a few months that there was only one drug that uh, would work for Daniel, and that was clozapine. The evidence was out there even back then. That's 17 years ago, mind you. Um, and so we started to ask for clozapine. Next slide, please. Um, and again, clozapine, I just want to give you a little historical perspective because it's been a misunderstood drug for a very long time. It came out and has been around since 1958. Families and patients have loved it. Unfortunately, there was the Finnish pandemic in 1975 where 16 elderly Finnish women developed severe neutropenia, eight died, and this is in one small Finnish village. And that led to clause being, being withdrawn from the market. But it came back in 1989 because there was a really a community upswelling and Dr. John Kane showed that clozapine will work where none of the other drugs were. Unfortunately, it got bundled 
it got restricted and it got rationed. And it is the way it was set up, not easy to use. The things we were faced with, next slide, was clozophobia when we went looking for clozapine. All we heard about were the horrible potential side effects of the drug. And a lot of these things do happen, but at a tiny percentage, and the vast majority of them can be absolutely avoided if you do it correctly. So there is an optimal way of using clozapine. We were told that Daniel would be a fat slug and would die from a low white count and be a diabetic. The things we heard, the drug of last resort, it was just really not the case. And the evidence for what people were telling me just didn't exist. And so the more we read, next slide, the more we realized that there was actually FDA indications for using this drug in this setting where Daniel had already failed five antipsychotics. He was supposed to be on it after the second failure of the drug. He had some suicidal ideation and just that he had the FDA indication. Uh, he was never violent, but it does do that. It reduces substance abuse. Fortunately, that was also not the case. But what it really does more than any of the other drugs is it gives the patient, the person an opportunity to, to have a meaningful recovery. And we were starting to go on the internet and look, the internet was actually going on, it was AOL back then, but you could still find recovery stories. And invariably, the recovery stories would be people that would be on clozapine. You'd read books and we'd read books and you'd find out uh, you know, the center cannot hold. She, she, uh, Ellen Sachs, she was on clozapine. And what we found out is that it's the best acceptance, the lowest dis discontinuation rate and the best survival. So well, no one told us that. It took us six different providers before someone was willing to do clozapine. And eventually we ended up taking over the care. Next slide. So this is a tremendous missed opportunity with psychotic spectrum disorders. The first year of psychosis is such a dangerous time. On average, there's a 50-fold mortality in this age group. And a lot of that is driven by suicide, accidents, and substance abuse, all things that clozapine could impact. Now, these numbers are a little bit on the high side, I must admit, but about a 2 to 3% incidence of completed suicide occurs in the first year of illness. Clozapine just reduces the risk of suicide anywhere from 70 to 90%, except for olanzapine, where it's 38% compared to other people. So let's say there's 10,000 people treated with clozapine. If you were to give clozapine, this would translate out to saving 380 to 900 lives. Why don't we use it? Why do we consider it the drug of last resort? Because of the risk of severe neutropenia. So what is that actual risk? Well, we were told 3%, but the real incidence is anywhere from 0 0.3 and actually more recently 0.23% to 0 0.8, which is really the highest end of the stick. And the mortality is one in 10,000. So we're throwing away close to between 500 and 1,000 lives a year to avoid that one death. And the other thing people never talk about is when does this occur? When is the low white count? It's in the first 18 weeks. After that, it's very similar to all the other antipsychotics. And after a year, its incidence is actually lower than many of the other antipsychotics. That includes olanzapine, that includes resper risperidone, and that includes most of the first generation antipsychotics. In Iceland, they don't do it. In Denmark, they stop at 18 weeks. China doesn't do it, but that doesn't really count. Um, but the bottom line is you can not only save all these people in the first year, psychosis cuts life short by 20 to 25 years. And a lot of that is the suicide, cigarettes and drug abuse, and clozapine impacts all of those significantly. Next slide. So this is a great study and it just came out further supporting what I'm talking about. So this gentleman, Taylor, who actually co-authored 
an article with uh, clozapine use during the COVID pandemic. Um, he did a 14 year study on his entire population of 3,500 patients. I think this is in New Zealand. And he found that there was only 16 incidents in that entire 14 years of a neutrophil count below 500. That is the definition of severe neutropenia. And that's basically when people are susceptible to infection. Now, he actually looked at those 16, he pulled the charts. Seven of the 16 were actually excluded because four were normal on repeat. One wasn't even on clozapine. Another one was getting chemotherapy and another was lab error. So there's only actually nine events and eight patients. So the incidence really of life threatening a granulocytosis, again, a white count of less than 500, was 0.23%. Of these eight patients, six had had an episode, and the number of deaths was zero. When did it occur? Again, very early on, average uh, of 48 days. When did it occur? And who did it occur in? It occurred in older individuals, just like that Finnish village. It was the older people, and there was no events in the 14 year history after that, after those 50 days or so. Next slide. So when do our patients get psychotic? Well, the average time of psychosis is during a, a very vulnerable period of neurodevelopment. So from 14 to 24. And uh, you know, when do, uh, when do we see a gran, a granulocytosis, severe neutropenia? The average age was 51. So again, the, the REMS, this requirement that we do our white counts is so overstated. And I think some that's one of the things we're trying to change. Next slide. So what we did is we looked at this. And if you look at the data, the number of low white counts, there's actually what's called the surveillance bias. So especially in the times of COVID, you're going to get a falsely, a falsely lowered white count which potentially will do more damage than if you did no monitoring at all. So it does more harm than good, the mandatory monitoring. Further evidence for that, next slide. We went to the FDA. We went to their own database. They're, it's called the Sentinel database. We looked at 94 million insurance claims and we put in diagnosis looking for all the forms of neutropenia from 2000 to 2013. Next slide. And what do we find? Whoa, look at that. Clozapine doesn't seem to do a heck of a lot of bad things with these young people. The incidence from 18 to 44 was an estimate of three episodes for every 10,000 years of risk. That is a tiny, tiny number. Now, if you look at Kepra, which is a uh, I won't even try to pronounce that. That's the, the, the largest bar. That was much higher. But if you look at olanzapine, which is Zyprexa, it was almost seven times the amount in the susceptible age group. And only if you look at the over 65, and certainly over, four, well, over 45, but especially over 65, where you're not going to be using a lot of clospine, that's when the risk is real. So it really makes no sense to be doing this horrible monitoring that we have to do with clozapine. Next slide. So what else do you know? And what do we come up with when we look at data that's actually out there? Well, Finland, unlike the United States, has a national database and they can follow everyone with a diagnosis. So this is the Fin 20 study, which is a 20 year history of 62,000 people with schizophrenia. So if a lot of people question, do you really need an antipsychotic? Well, after 20 years without an antipsychotic, and this is now we're talking about early 40s or late 30-year-old gentlemen and, and ladies, there's almost a 50% mortality with nothing. Now, if you use an antipsychotic, that gets reduced to a little over 25%. And with clozapine, it's down to about even half of that. And again, the 45% reduction in cardiovascular deaths, but more than anything, this is driven by less substance abuse, less suicide, less accidents. Next slide. But you can see, uh, if you look at the suicide, that reduction. With clozapine, the 
incidence of suicide per 100,000 individuals essentially is the same as what it is in the general population. Next slide, please. Now I'd like to turn to what I really want to explain, and I want to take a little time with this, because this I want to talk to you about what is psychosis, because this is poorly understood by not only lay people, but I've seen also professionals. So psychosis is a complex polygenetic neurodevelopmental disorder, which is incredibly heterogeneous, and if not properly treated, neurodegenerative, if not properly treated. This first slide reflects is what's called a Manhattan plot, and it looks at what was then described as 108 genes. We're, we're now in the hundreds. This was from 2014, but it's just such a lovely plot, and I've been using this slide for a while. There's one plot, that skyscraper, that is really important, and that is a plot, that is a, uh, a gene that describes something called complement C4A, which is overexpressed in a good percentage of people that go on to develop psychotic disorders. What complement is usually used for is to mark cells that are foreign to the body, like something that got infected, uh, and you need to remove that cell, and the, the immune cells will do that. In the brain, something called microglia will do that. That gene in and of itself, in some studies, is responsible for up to as high an incidence as a quarter of the psychotic risk in any individual. Next slide, please. Okay, now a lot of people have been seeing their psychiatrist or their internist, but they've come, you know, a lot of your kids have gotten psychiatric care well before the time they developed a psychotic disorder. And the reason for that is because the illness started essentially in utero. So there's genetic factors, there's perinatal complications. And what that leads to is changes in pathways. Um, Robert Friedman's talked a lot about this, the poor development of the nicotinic receptors. And this is one of the reasons, and I'll take this as an aside. So you know where everyone's been taking folate to prevent neural tube defects. So in family members where there's a strong predominance, and I maybe not even in, with a strong predominance because serious mental illness is everywhere, a new recommendation from the uh, ob uh, Gyne Association is that you add something called lecithin, which is phosphatidylcholine. What that does is it drives enough choline into the system of the fetus as it's developing. And that helps promote the formation of nicotinic receptors. Just go back to the slide before that. So a lot of these genes that you see the smaller skyscrapers represent nicotinic receptor problems. And again, just doing that little manipulation will make a big difference. Go back, next, next, thank you. Um, no, 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 go back. Back, thank you. Let's stay on this for a little bit. Um, so we do that. We do vitamin D3, 2,000 international units. And uh, the, the dose of phosphatidylcholine is 3,600 milligrams twice a day. And you add that to your folate. So you can start to make a difference. So what Friedman also noted is that if he went back and looked at films of kids that go on and develop psychotic disorders, so you go back to your old family films, he could tell in a good number of the kids that they may be a little clumsier, they're a little slower to develop than their siblings. Again, showing that these disorders start very early on. So, and if you combine that with starvation, early trauma, then you turn on other genes during childhood, and that further influences what goes on in your brain and can lead to worsening in the synaptic pruning and just a general decline in what's called your gray matter, the, the, the neuronal tissue in your brain. Um, 
as time goes on and neurodevelopment is not normal, a lot of these kids have very slow processing speed. And often they'll have inattention, an attention deficit disorder, and your kids will be given that diagnosis. These actually are what is called prodromal. Prodromal means before the full-fledged syndrome, kind of like a, pre, a prequel to the main event. And this will be what we call negative symptoms. Often they'll have some learning issues. They may have trouble going into large rooms with a lot of people because they have trouble with sensory perception where they can't filter out all the noise and they get overwhelmed. They then go into adolescence. Adolescence is normally, when you hit 13 or 14, your brain is at its largest. Normal development consists of having some pruning. It's kind of like taking your hedge and making a beautiful mini, like in Disney World. You know, you get, get rid of all the excess stuff and get all the normal uh, passages just where they should be. That's normal neural development. But when you have an overexpression of complex C4A, that pruning becomes excessive and you start to lose pathways. And as you lose pathways, you start to lose touch with reality. Now you couple that with substance abuse, especially uh, uh, cannabis, and you increase that risk of turning on other genes, more epigenetic phenomena, and you start to get dopamine dysregulation. Dopamine dysregulation, the inability to tell what is real from what is not real. You know, that feeling of paranoia, that sense that someone said something, the sensory misinterpretation leads to the full-flown psychotic syndrome that we're all so familiar with, the delusions and the hallucinations. Okay, and again, often coupled with substance abuse. So what are you gonna call it at that time? So it's now gone from attention deficit disorder to substance abuse psychosis. And what do you do? You give them an antipsychotic. They get better, they come off the pot. But time marches on. The negative symptoms persist. And unfortunately, in the vast majority of these kids, neurodegeneration continues. They get another little stressor. They get another positive symptom. They still have a large mood component. They tend to be what we call manic. It's actually psychosis. It's just them being out of control. And all of a sudden, we call it mania with psychosis. They march on. They get more of a thought disorder. They become disorganized. They really start to not take good care of their hygiene, but there's still a mood component. Now we call it schizoaffective. Time continues to march on. It's much more thought disorder. There's less of a mood component. And now we call it schizophrenia. It's a psychotic spectrum disorder. You're just catching these kids at different parts of the neurodevelopment. And the whole idea, and we'll talk a lot about this, is you want to change the trajectory of the illness. And that is by using clospine. Next slide. So again, what are the clinical features? First of all, it is a social occupational dysfunction and a detachment from reality. It's work interpersonal and self-care, but it's that detachment. That's what psychosis is. And each of these pathways represents a part of the psychotic spectrum. The salience pathway, the ability to recognize what is real and what is not, is marked by dopaminergic regulation. When it becomes dysregulated, then you get the delusions, the hallucinations, you get disorganized, and at the worst case, catatonia. You just become motionless, you become so internally directed that you're detached from the environment. But there's other components to psychosis, and this is where people go a myth because we're always talking about the psychotic breaks. My experience, and this has been 15 years now of doing this, is people continue to have some level of psychosis. Maybe it's not the positive symptoms, but the negative symptoms where you have the flat affect, where they can't really get started. They have no sense of enjoyment. They withdraw from the environment. They'll go to their room. Their speech is short. How many times have you had a conversation when it's a one word answer coming back at you? And that is another mode that is called the default, default mode network. And these are all well-described pathways in your brain. 
as is the executive network, where they actually lose their ability to remember things, where their attention and focus becomes worse. A lot of this is driven by the underlying slow processing speed. Again, if you can't have good processing speed, it's really tough to involve yourself in executive, or, or in, excuse me, in social engagement, because there's a lot of off and on, you have to block out external stimuli, and it's really tough to focus unless you have that processing speed and that ability for focus. Finally, in kids, actually, this is kind of interesting, who have positive symptoms and where the negative and executive symptoms are not so bad, there's often a huge mood component and a sense of hopelessness. And ultimately, that's what drives the suicidality and also the, anxiety, the agitation and hostility. I put in comorbid substance abuse, abuse because if you count alcohol, cigarettes, with pot, 85% of kids when they're part of this psychotic illness are using comorbid drugs. Next slide, please. So this is the group we're taking care of. That's it. It consists of the entire spectrum. So this was data now that's a year old. We collect data every February. So you're catching me right at the end of, uh, of a period and we're restarting. So this represented 180 patients that we had. We're over 200 now. And what's cool about this is these people that are truly engaged, 94% rate of continuation once they started on the medicine. And we're not truly a first episode psychosis clinic. 54% of our patients are already on clozapine at intake. Now, it represents 75% or so fit that schizophrenia diagnosis, but a full quarter to 30% uh, do not, with a good percent of the being bipolar with psychosis. But again, don't get caught up with the diagnosis. I want to emphasize this again, and that's why we titled the talk this way. It's a psychosis spectrum. Next slide. So of these 120, you would expect us not to do terribly well because one, Men don't do as well as women, and we had a very strong male predominance. Our average age is 34. In other words, they've been down the road quite a bit. Again, when do people develop psychosis on the whole? Late teens, early 20s. Our youngest was 17 at this time. I've actually, God help me, being an adult uh, nephrologist and doing psychiatry, I've been taking younger kids of late, not so much the last few months, but you know, certainly we've added some 14 to 15 year olds. Our longest uh, on patient on clozapine is now well over 30 years. And what also would predict a very poor outcome is this phenomena called anosognosia. And it's not lack of insight. It is a physical neurologic condition where they are not aware of their illness. Just like if you had a stroke, and you know, someone asks you to raise your left hand and you have that part of the brain that gives you awareness of that hand. And you say, I can lift it. You can't, but you don't, you, you would have no awareness. So, you know, I'd have people lift their arms up. It's the same thing. They have no awareness of the illness. Almost 60% came to us. We've used court mandated treatment in Connecticut, along with Maryland and Massachusetts are the three states without court mandated treatment. Hopefully that will change over time. I believe uh, Nevada and Pennsylvania also have AOT, but have not instituted this yet. We also have a large extended community, and that consists of people all over the country. In fact, we have a few internationals that join our weekly Zooms. Next, next slide. So I'm not going to say everyone's a success because you know a lot of people that have come to us have refused to take the medicine. If we cannot get engagement, if there's not adequate support, you can't use clozapine. In other words, if someone has anosognosia, they don't think there's anything wrong with them, they don't have a meaningful relationship and a good support structure, be it your family or an ACT team, if there's someone that cares enough, I need at least that. Otherwise, you really can't use 
clozapine. We did have the 10 discontinuations. We've had two deaths. I've had one suicide. It still pains me to this day. And then the other woman died at age 93 on clozapine after being one of these very, very early uh, patients on it in the 70s. And it got carried over from uh, Bronx State for many, many years. She died in early 2000s. Uh, and I did lose 24% uh, that were either dismissed or transferred to another practice. Next slide. So how are we different? How is Team Daniel different? We do not use clozapine as a last resort. It is a first. If I can get someone, they come to me, I'll only take care of them if they will start clozapine. Patients deserve the right to be well. Um, if you saw People Magazine today, um, very heroic character, Eric uh, Smith, I believe his name is. He's actually a great guy. I've talked to him multiple times. He's in the middle of uh, People Magazine. AOTs can bring these kids back. Court-mandated treatment in kids that really you can't get a therapeutic relationship with is a lifesaver. The thing we don't do is we don't tolerate side effects. We're very aggressive about mitigating every side effect there is. We monitor because it's better to trust, but you must verify. And a lot of these kids won't take their meds. So you need to know that they're taking their meds and you need to know what levels they have because we'll talk more about this, but there's a tremendous difference in how people metabolize. We go very slow. Clozapine, as it stands right now, is a lifetime medicine. There is no rush. We cross titrate off of other antipsychotics. We don't stop the other antipsychotic initially. We'll have both on board and we do a slow cross titration. We are very aggressive about diet and exercise and we mean it. Exercise is probably the only magic bullet we have. But what we really believe in and what we found is that we can return a good percentage of our kids to the level of function that they had pre-illness. And well, how we do this is again, a sense of community. We engage not only the kid, but the family. And we really combat learned helplessness and hopelessness. So optimism is critical. And I'm a very optimistic guy. Next slide. Again, why clozapine first? As I uh, alluded to in the very first slide, we lose a lot of people by suicide. It does give the best survival. Anything you can do to treat the duration of psychosis is going to improve the trajectory of the illness. Shutting down that over pruning, that mycoglia essentially changes the trajectory of these kids' illnesses. Clozapine has been shown to have better compliance and better recovery. Again, suicide risk, I used the lower number here, 24, but it was 24 to 89 times decreased mortality, decreased early aggression. Kids like it, believe it or not, when they're on it. It quiets their brain instead of deadening it. Deadening it. And, you know, it's really important for the substance abuse as well. Um, also very important in terms of not only suicide, but homicide. But again, meaningful recovery. The earlier you use it, the less damage there is to the brain, the faster is the recovery. It doesn't mean it won't work if you're 10 years into the illness, but it's going to take a longer period of time. Next slide. And this is what happens if you let kids go and you let the illness continue. If you look at this slide, you'll see a dark center. That is the ventricular system of the brain and the surrounding gray matter. And you can see after the quote unquote relapses, which as I already mentioned, reflect the ongoing positive symptoms, the ventricles are getting larger and larger. And what does that mean? He's losing his neural tissue. Next slide, please. So how do we define meaningful recovery? We're pretty, we want a robust recovery. We want 20 hours a week. Again, full-time or part-time school or vocation, being a homemaker, being in an active program, looking at a vocational opportunity, so like a pros program or engage in consistent volunteer activity for 20 hours. In other words, you're not in the basement, you're socially engaged, 
you're doing something with meaning and purpose. Next slide. So what is the rate of recovery that's been out there in the literature? And this literature looks at a recovery that's less robust than what we've described. Their recovery is having over a five-year period, a period of a year where symptoms are well controlled, they have some social engagement, they have some vocation, full opportunity, be it volunteer or not, and they're not in the hospital. That's their definition. There's a 14% incidence when you look at the general uh, literature. So in New Zealand, where they use a lot of clozapine, the results were a little better, 37%. When people came to us, again, remember, we had 54% already on clozapine. We were at a recovery rate using our definition of 26%. After a year, going on for a year of maintaining a recovery, we're at 73%. And that's not good enough, but it's a hell of a lot better than what's out there. Next slide. And again, it's across all spectrums less pervasive psychotic disorders like bipolar, we do a little better than we do with schizophrenia where there's more of a thought disorder and also more, more commonly either a genetic burden that's larger or a longer time of, of psychosis or both. Next slide, please. As I said, AOT saves lives and not only saves lives, it allows people to recover. So eight of nine of our kids with um, anosognosia, the inability to really uh, form enough of a therapeutic relationship without a court order. Eight of nine are working now and, you know, in meaningful recovery. Next slide. Ah, the other thing, the revolving door. How many times have you had your kids come in and out of the hospital? Oh my God, the drug doesn't work anymore. And again, all these medicines work they do show some improvement over where you're starting at, but they quote unquote wear off or they stop working. Well, the illness is continuing on. Not that the drug is stopped working. It's just that the illness has continued its neurodegenerative path. So 93% of the kids were in the hospital in the year or two before the coming to us. Since coming to us, we've had a 15% hospitalization rate. Uh, and only nine of the, of the 18 hospitalization were for mental health use or mental health issues. The rest were for physical issues. Next slide, please. Wait, remember I told you my son would be a fat slug and that was guaranteed almost to me? Well, it turns out in the literature, a lot of these kids really do develop tremendous weight gain. You know, 7% body weight, you know, 15, 20, 30 pounds. Um, and almost half do that with the lanzapine and a third to a half, 35% is a little low actually with the clozapine historically. Uh, and we did see some weight gain in our, in our cohort, but it was 22% next. But what, where we really saw the weight gain is with our kids were underweight and on average, they gained 10 pounds. Whereas our overweight individuals on the whole lost 13 pounds and are severely obese, having BMIs greater than 40, lost 34. Not, we weren't perfect with everyone, especially young women of color is probably the one area that I've struggled with the most, but I'm not giving up and I'm gonna get it. And you know, as they get better, they can participate more and it may take years, but we eventually get these kids to start to lose weight. Next slide. Now, what's really changed things is the weekly, um, what are called incretin mimetics, the uh, glucose, uh, excuse me, glucagon-like peptide one agonists. These drugs work incredibly well to uh, help with weight, uh, weight loss. And uh, this is just an example of a kid who I did struggle with who I started on, these are the drugs, the semaglutide, the liraglutide, and terzepatide, better known as Trulicity, Ozempic, Wagovi is the other name for semaglutide, and Mungero. Adding this, and this is this, uh, who's that, a female? Let's do a male, next slide. 
again, same thing, big struggle, add these things. These things really change the trajectory of uh, the weight. Um, it really blocks appetite, helps with insulin resistance, um, and has uh, changed uh, our practice. Next slide. So you could see after using these medicines for the last two years or so, our obesity incidence in our practice has almost halved in this time frame. And it's just getting better and better. Um, these drugs do have side effects. You have to use them carefully. But if you do it in a judicious manner and you can get it approved by your insurance company, they're incredibly useful. And we add these to metformin and we use add these to the sodium glucose transport inhibitors. Next slide. Uh, substance abuse, the scourge, you know, the, the co-occurring condition. Well, again, we had 54 people already on clozapine coming to us. So we had a 50% substance abuse rate, which is a little low considering that, you know, I already quoted the 75% figure. But after one year, we were down to 8% usage and 82% recovery with cannabis. Not everyone, again, not good enough, but a lot better than the literature. Next slide. And the cigarettes, this was really an accomplishment because we were told how tough it is to get people with serious mental illness to quit smoking. And it's not only clozapine, we use everything that we have. And we use a lot of uh, Chantix, we use a lot of nicotine replacement, and we use a lot of bupropion. But we've gotten fully two thirds of our people to withdraw from cigarettes. And that is an accomplishment that's gonna, you know. A lot of people poo pooed me. Um, I'm looking at Brian Karras there, and you know, this is, he thought his son would never stop smoking. And again, I have too many people that have said, oh, forget about the cigarettes. But invariably, they just seem to have less of a dependence. Next slide. So it's not all wine and roses. Again, we're very aggressive in managing these people. The two things I fear the most with clozapine are pneumonia and constipation. And pneumonia has been where we've had most of our hospitalizations, actually. And a lot of this, of course, has been driven by COVID because for the last three years, there's been a lot of pneumonia. And I have to emphasize that you must have your kids fully vaccinated. Please get them their flu shots. Please get them up to date with their COVID vaccines. I can't emphasize that enough. But we've had some seizures. And again, because we do push levels, we've had kids, again, that are 10 years out. Again, a lot of kids that were quote unquote treatment failures with clozapine. And they just needed to go up higher. But with that, you lower seizure threshold. We've had the one cardiomyopathy, the only person that I've ever had to withdraw from clozapine. He happened to be a 72-year-old renal transplant patient, so it shouldn't have been a terrible surprise. I have not had one myocarditis, not one. Since this slide was published, I will come clean. I did have a 72-year-old woman who had a thromboembolism. Next slide, please. We've had some neutropenia. Now, I want to get back to the substantial weight gain. When we look at the charts of these kids, seven of the substantial weight gain uh, of the 11, there, there's only 11, uh, were really tied to poor compliance. The others, they gained weight. And as I said, we're still trying to figure it out and still working on it. Um, We've had one thing that is really apparent, movement disorders is really uncommon and people don't talk about that enough. Clozapine flits on and off the dopamine two receptor, which is your movement. L more, it flits off so fast that dopamine itself has more binding. In the old days, before all these drugs came out, when I was in training, we used to, say that you needed 60 to 80% occupancy of the dopamine 2 receptors just to affect a good antipsychotic uh, you know, effect, effect. Yeah, I think that's how it's used. And we would essentially make them Parkinsonian. You do not see movement disorders on the whole with clozapine. Next slide. Now, this slide I really want to dwell on. Again, so 
we were told to grieve our son. He would never be the same. I found that really unacceptable. And, you know, I was fortunate enough to end up in Boston to uh, meet a fellow by the name of Dr. Michael Muffson um, up at Harvard. He's actually been teacher of the year twice. And he said to me, he said, the only kids that I have that have psychotic disorders that have gone on and gone to college and really had full productive life, they're all on clozapine. That was enough for me. So pre-illness, these kids had their issues. This is what's called the Global Assessment of Function Scoring System. A uh, hundred, you're like a god. Everyone wants to see you. No one's a hundred. Even Joe Biden's not a hundred. All right. Maybe not even in 95 these days. Um, even Barack Obama. All right, I shouldn't show my politics so much. But nevertheless, you're someone that everyone will be attracted to. You're a magnet. You can do everything well. 80, these are kids that are functioning pretty well. They're in school or they're working. They have friends. They may have some anxiety disorders. Untreated, they're severely ill. They're almost uniformly hospitalized. And many of them are suicidal or homicidal. They're really sick. So as I said, all the other antipsychotics work. They get up to a global assessment, a function of 38. These kids, that's twice as good as 19. That's a significant improvement. I don't, I, you know, I'm not going to contest that, but it's not good enough. 38 means they're still isolated. They don't have any friendships. They're not working. They're still pretty disabled by the psychotic uh, syndrome. The kids on the previous clozapine regimens that came to us came back with significant recovery. 56, and that's an interesting number because New Zealand used that same number for their 37% recovery. 56, they're back in school. They have a lot of symptoms still, but they have some socialization. They're doing a little work maybe, and they're clearly much more attached to reality and not, not disabled by their symptoms. Our kids, and this is a small sample size, essentially have returned back to the level of functioning before they got ill. Next slide. Now we're going to tell you how we do it. So the first step is really getting to know who the family is and who the kid is. Everyone's in a lot of pain. I'm a big believer in very limited barriers. I really, I'm a hugger, which you can't do with a very psychotic individual in the beginning because you know, I've I've had chairs thrown at me, a little bit worse than that. But, you know, with a family, you just tell them to have hope. And I just, it's having a sense of optimism and a belief that you can get the kid better. I can't tell you how important that is. I'm a real cheerleader. I am not trained in psychiatry. Remember, I am a nephrologist, a gerontologist. I've taking my courses in cognitive behavioral therapy and dialectic behavioral therapy. I took my LEAP course multiple times with Javier Amador. I know Javi really well, but I'm not a therapist. But I, what I am good at is I'm good at befriending people. And there's really good data. Just befriending and normalizing really goes a long way to establishing a therapeutic relationship. I do try to use Javi Amador's approach. Uh, reflective listening is really a tool, excuse me. Ah, thank you. So reflective listening, in other words, making sure that the, the, the person suffering from psychosis is, is being heard. Just before you jump to empathy, you must establish that first. Just telling them in their own words, you can paraphrase a little bit, but only a little bit what they said to you and say, is that right? Then you can go to empathy. And then you find something that you both can agree on and you try to partner with them because it's establishing and bonding that relationship that's important. Now, if you're the kid is so detached from reality, you can't get a relationship. You need engagement. Again, if you, get, if you can't get engagement, you can't use clozapine. We can stop the talk right here. You're on an injectable antipsychotic, and that's the best we can do. Um, I don't believe that's the case in the vast majority of people. I think the laws hurt us a lot, and they get in the way a lot, but I think you can engage the vast majority. And you've got to let your boundaries down. You have to make sure that they feel accepted. 
and that they're a person and treated like a person. It never hurts to be nice. Next goal. Next slide, that is. So, and also the other thing is, it isn't easy. You know what? They're going to screw up and I'm going to screw up. It, it's part of life. We are pushing boundaries. This is a devastating illness unless you're aggressive. I found this out when I, again, as a nephrologist, I used to take care of the sickest of the lupus patients and the diabetic. And if you were not aggressive in their care and really manage them so, you were dooming these people. It's the same thing with psychotic illnesses. You've got to be there for them. So I'm always available. Families get my cell number. They get my email. And I try to be as compassionate and available as time as I can be. I can be a little ornery at times, and people know that as well. But everyone leaves my office with the treatment note. And I share this with the family. Now, if a kid who's psychotic tells me, don't share with the family, you know what I do? I use best judgment and I share with the family. And that is not violating the HIPAA laws. Again, hop, optimism, optimism, optimism. And you've really got to combat that learned hopelessness. Next slide. So the nuts and bolts, you've really got to do the, the medicine. So you have to do therapeutic uh, drug monitoring. You want to make sure that they're taking their meds. There is a certain level that you need to get to in the vast majority of people with psychotic illnesses, especially in the resistant schizophrenia, the people that have failed two drugs at therapeutic uh, amounts for a therapeutic amount of time. These kids will not get better on anything but clozapine, but you also need adequate levels. And those levels are defined as usually anywhere from 350 to 420 nanograms per uh, uh, deciliter. And those are the beginning of when they're starting to respond at 75%. It doesn't mean that's their optimal level. But if you're at 100 and they're wildly psychotic and you're saying clozapine failed, you have done them a disservice. So you've got to do therapeutic drug monitoring. You want to weigh them every visit. You want to check blood pressures. Clozapine can lower your blood pressure. You always, and what we do in the beginning is we follow something called high sensitivity CRP, C-reactive proteins. That is an incredibly sensitive test to see if there's inflammation in the body. If there is inflammation, at that point, I will do and look for myocarditis, and that is the troponins. I don't do troponin I's or T's. I do plain troponins. The I's and T's are way too sensitive and nonspecific, and they're just going to make you crazy. I don't tolerate the high heart rates, but we always check it, and we'll talk about that. And then, of course, because the FDA mandates it, again, for the first 26 weeks, weekly CBCs, and then every other week for another 26 weeks, and then every four weeks for life, we do the, C, the complete blood count with the neutrophil count. And I said, if the FDA listens to me in the next few years, I will be getting rid of this. You do want to check glycohemoglobins. You want to check liver function and kidney function. And again, as Ronald Reagan said, trust but verify. Do your tox screens. Check your cotinine levels. The cotinine is for cigarettes. Next slide, please. And this is a slide we'll spend a lot more time on. You want to avoid the predictable side effects. Weight gain can come on unbelievably fast in these drugs. I've seen kids in the hospital where it's ignored and they'll come out in four to five weeks, 30, 40 pounds heavier. It's amazing how much you could eat when you're on clozapine. So I'm um, very early on, I will introduce metformin. Clozapine decreases uh, GLP-1. Uh, you know, and you, if you reduce that, you're basically, you're making these kids what are called insulin resistance, a pre-diabetic state, and they are always hungry. There's clozapine is uh, what's called an antihistamine. Um, and if you know what Benadryl does, it makes you sleepy, but it also makes you very hungry. And uh, it's also an anti-cholinergic, and that also plays into the tremendous weight gain. So very early metformin, the sodium glucose transport inhibitors, um, 
Those are uh, four drugs. Invacana was the first one, Jardians and Farsiga and Stiglatro are the four that are on the market. And as I already mentioned, the GLP-1 receptor agonists, which are injectable weekly, you can mitigate weight gain. High triglycerides and metabolic syndrome, it's the same thing, except you sometimes will need to use statins. And on occasion, you will need to use the phenofibrates for the high triglycerides. I can't emphasize enough that as these kids get better, they can participate in their care. So you give them a plant-based diet and you give them an exercise regimen. And some of these kids have adopted this. Then you can use other things that can cut their appetite. So I threw this in here, high dose famotidine, good old Pepsid, use that 100 milligrams twice a day and it's been shown to decrease the appetite. Again, a predictable side effect. As levels of clozapine go up, so does heart rate. It is a predictable side effect. The sympathetic, there's two sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. Parasympathetic is all about relaxing, digestion. Your heart slows down. That's from cholinergic or tone, acetylcholine tone. And what clozapine does is it's anticholinergic. So it slows digestion markedly, but it, it also speeds up the heart. So we will use uh, a lot of beta blockers. And if a lot of these kids are anxious, I will use beta blockers that cross the blood brain barrier because taking care of that anxiety is often very useful. Now, if there's no anxiety and you just want to slow the heart rate, you'll use one that doesn't cross the blood brain barrier. So I'll use propranolol or metoprolol if I want to go across the blood brain barrier or atenolol. And I start at very low doses and then I move them up. And again, they're very useful. You do not allow someone to be running with a constant heart rate of 120. People will develop cardiomyopathies. In other words, their heart will slowly cease to work as well as it, it should. The muscle essentially tires and the heart expands out. And that's what's called the cardiomyopathy. That is a rate-induced cardiomyopathy. These are preventable things the only cardio in the vast majority. I mean, I did have that one cardiomyopathy, but that was a 72-year-old gentleman. I have not seen any other sequelae of cardiac disease. And this is, again, going 15 years. Seizures. Clozapine lowers the seizure threshold. We tend to use higher doses. I am not shy. My drug of choice is something called lamotrigine. The most characteristic seizure the one that is, quote unquote, pathognomonic for clozapine is something called a myoclonic seizure. And that is essentially a drop attack. It is not the most common seizure you get with clozapine, but it's the one that is associated with it. And again, lamotrigine is a decent drug for that. It is better for generalized seizures. I have to update this slide. Um, I'm using another drug called Lucasamide. Vimpat is the trade name, and that has been really useful. But I'll use gabapentin, toparamate, and if I'm desperate, Depakote, val valproate. I don't like to use a lot of valproate because its side effect profile with clozapine weight gain, sedation is bad. And also early on, it does increase the incidence of myocarditis and a granulocytosis. And the reason for that is it partially blocks clozapine metabolism. So the rates go up too fast. But in a pinch, I've used Depakote. Drooling, you don't want to tolerate drooling. It can be dangerous. So as the clozapine, you're dosing it, you'll, you will see they'll have a metabolism to norclozapine. It is the norclozapine that actually causes the drooling. And you can prevent that, and that is cholinergic. You can give eye drops, atropine eye drops, or an ipitropium nasal spray. These are anticholinergic agents under the tongue. When desperate, as long as there's no constipation, you'll use glycoperylate. Always elevate the head, but you know, be aware of this. Next slide. Constipation, moving on to constipation, the thing I fear. Again, it's anticholinergic. 
Remember, parasympathetic promotes gastric motility and stomach and intestine digestion. Well, clozapine slows that down. There's a universal decrease in the contractility of your entire GI tract, all the way from the swallowing mechanism, the esophagus, the stomach, small intestines, large intestines. You must be aware of this. Hydration is step number one, but these kids need things to stimulate their bowels, and stool softeners are very useful. Interesting. Um, uh, laxatives, I use um, lactulose. Milk of, or Miralax is incredibly useful. What you don't use, because it slows down the, uh, the bowel even further, is uh, things like Metamucil. You do not use fiber supplements. A diet full of fruits and vegetables is great. And that's a great starting point. When you're really stuck, there's new drugs out there that are what are called secretogs. They actually increase the water content of your bowel and decrease chloride reabsorption, something called Linzess. There's another one, True Lance, that works in a similar manner, are very useful, but they're expensive. The neutropenia, again, you have to realize that if you get a low white count, you have to know when you're taking it. There's what's called a circadian rhythm. It, it's lowest in the morning. So if you get a low white count, just repeat it in the afternoon. Also, white cells live on the blood vessel wall, 50% of them. And if you start to exercise, and what I'll do is I'll have them go up and down on a step in my office and repeat the white count. Um, and that causes what's called demargination. The white cell, which is sitting and unavailable to be measured in the plasma, plasma in the blood, uh, becomes available. And you'll see a 50% or so increase in uh, the uh, white count. And also recognize, in, uh, especially in the, our uh, black population, benign ethnic neutropenia. Uh, in other words, their white counts tend to be a little lower. It's actually interesting. We used to avoid uh, clozapine in people of color because of this, but as it turns out, you have that somewhat protective. So whereas in someone without benign ethnic neutropenia, you only start clozapine when the white count is over 1,500. In this population, you can start with a white count of 1,000. That's an ANC, absolute neutrophil count, I'm sorry. Um, nighttime urination, it can be embarrassing and people are ashamed of it, but you're so sedated initially with claws being in the middle of the night and it does kind of, de well, it does decrease the bladder tone so that if you drink too much before bedtime and you're really sedated and it also works on the bladder wall so that it becomes a little more sensitive to filling so it'll tend to squeeze. So now you have a sphincter that's not working well. Some of these kids will wet their bed. You don't want that to happen. And if it does happen, it's easy to remedy. You just do behavioral changes. You don't have them drink an hour or two before bedtime. And you can use something called DDAVP. That's anti-diuretic hormone, desmopressin. And that works exceedingly well. It's an oral formulation. You start at 0.1 milligram. The other thing is Mirbatrique. You have to be careful with that, but that relaxes the bladder so it doesn't contract as much, but it can cause constipation. Again, a low blood pressure can happen. When I'm treating people remotely, I insist upon two things that I monitor, three things actually, weight, blood pressure, and pulse. So I have them all get an electronic blood pressure cuff, and I make sure that they sit and stand because as you're going up, with the clozapine, initially the blood pressures can fall, not hypertension, hypotension. So what we do is we'll promote a high salt diet in severe cases. If you go up slow enough, usually it doesn't happen, but in some kids that have to go to extremely high levels, you'll need something called floodrocortisone. That is what's called a mineral corticoid. It makes it retain salt and water. Severe cases, you want to actually squeeze the blood vessels down. So you'll give something that increases that squeeze, something called midodrine. Nausea and vomiting, again, slowing the gastric, emptying, slowing the GI tract. 
is something that is a frequent occurrence. So we're incredibly aggressive, again, with using ondansetron, 40 milligrams once a day or twice a day. In severe cases, we'll use, and it's really specific for the chemo trigger receptor zone. It's very specific for vomiting. It's used for what's called hyperemesis gravida, which is when you know uh, people in their first trimester of pregnancy uh, vomit too much. So if it's safe in pregnancy, it's really safe here. Um, having said that, sometimes that's not enough and I'll have to use something called metoclopramide. I try to avoid using it for long-term because it is a phenothiazide-like drug and long-term high doses is associated with tardive. I've never seen it. I use it, especially early on, um, use low doses and it's very safe. Next slide. Very important. You know, we always talk about the negative symptoms being the most important in determining how people do. So you want to go after cognition, but you first make sure that you have good control of the negative symptoms. So often what we do is we will split the regimen morning and night early on in the illness so that you really have good control. And then we start to go after and we use medicines that increase acetylcholine, acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, drugs like denepazole. That's the only one I use because it's well tolerated. Tends to decrease the appetite and it helps GI contractility and it helps with weight gain. But more than anything else, it often will help with attention because it works on nicotinic receptors. Bupropion, again, we use that for smoking cessation. And the reason is because it works, again, primarily at that nicotinic receptors. Fomotidine, again, it's an anti, it's an antihist, well, it's, it's, yeah, it's antihistamine at, you know, H2 blocker at low doses. You go to very high doses, it actually ends up stimulating histamine in the brain. And then we use a drug called memetine, which works on an area of cells located near the the, uh, the hippocampus, and that is evolved with memory, NMDA cells, and it helps form a circuit with the prefrontal cortex and has been shown in multiple studies to be useful long-term for uh, cognition, but these are all long-term. Shorter agents and ones I use down the road are modofinil and armodofinil. Those are indirect dopamine stimulants. I never will use a uh, dopaminergic agent such as Ritalin or Concerta. Um, we use a little bit of stuff for, uh, uh, for OCD. Uh, I've given up on Wakex, um, but more than anything else, these kids get well enough so that they can stay involved. And so psychosis informed cognitive behavioral therapy dialectic behavioral therapy, family therapy, cognition, cognitive enhancement programs all help and we treat co-occurring. Next. Next slide. There we go. It's not easy. If I showed you this slide earlier, you would have turned it all off. The average number of medicines is 11. Having said that, it's just filling up a pill box. And it's doable because we've been doing it for 15 years. Next slide, please. And this one, I want to spend a little time. As I said, we rarely use Depakote because it makes the side effects worse with Clozapine. We also don't use Cogentin. There's something to use that for movement disorders. We stay away from that. A lot of people will use it for the excessive salivation. But if we need to use an oral agent, we use glycoperolate. Hydroxacin is an antihistamine that they use for anxiety. I stay away from that since it really hurts cognition. And as I said, we never use stimulants. Benzos, I'm not going to be a purist early on. They're very useful. What I object to is that they stay on long-term and I'm always there to try to get rid of them. Next slide. But it has to be done very slowly and very carefully. I have to say that. So exercise is a winner in all settings. It's been studied a million times. I always see another study coming out. It is truly the only magic bullet. And again, exercise and engagement. Every Saturday, when the weather gets good again, we're going to have kids to our house. This is what we were doing pre-COVID pandemic. 
and the house is like magic. The normalization, the socializations, these kids didn't have friends, a lot of them, for years, and they now have a community. Now we're Zooming. That's, that's COVID and the weather. Next slide, please. As I said, every study that's looked at, general psychopathology gets better. The true magic bullet. If you can get people to run, their quality of life just gets better. Next slide. And this is the limited team. I have one more member. We're all running Boston together. Um, they'll be my 25th straight. Uh, these two on the end, this will be their third. Boston and also for Michael Orth. Michael Orth is our commissioner of mental health for Westchester and frequent runners. This little gentleman, oh, I can't, I can't point, I'm sorry. The, the smaller of, the, of us, uh, Jasper there just ran a 313 marathon and Malachi is a, a 340 or so marathoner. Anything is possible with clospine. There is really very little limitations. Next slide. The diet, again, I emphasize, don't drink your calories. No soda, no juice. Avoid processed foods. We really stress fruits and vegetables and staying away, again, processed foods, staying away from the crap. Those simple carbs can really get you. Next slide. The thing, again, I want to emphasize again, when you start clozapine, and I just got off the phone with someone at uh, Weiler, Weiler Cornell, yeah. And he says, we've had so much myocarditis. And I go, how fast do you go up on your clozapine? And he goes up approximately four times as fast as we do. Same thing in Australia. I gave the talk in Sydney and they go up the same rate. We know if you go slowly, you don't get myocarditis in the vast, vast majority. I have never seen it. It's the other advantage is you get to a therapeutic level. You get to see what you need. And over time, I usually split when there's a lot of positive symptoms. I do do the majority of the dosing at bedtime. Next slide. This is just an initiation table. I just want you to have it so that you have it. Next slide. And this next slide is a maintenance table. It is complicated, but it's doable. And this is just useful so that you could have it as a referral. Next slide. What are the advantages? Again, you get the lowest dose, you minimize sedation, and you get to add the other agents so you can take care of the predictable side effects. But again, cardiomyopathy and myocarditis is almost non-existent if you do it slow enough, and you get a better tolerance. and allows you to cross taper off the other drugs, so it's just safer. Next slide. Again, in the literature, 150 to 200 milligrams a week, way too fast. We're anywhere from 12 and a half milligrams weekly to 50 at the very fast. The more reasonable literature is 50 to 100. Usually my patients that are outpatient, I'll go 12 and a half twice, uh, twice a week, every three days. People are real familiar with that. Next slide. And again, this allows me to get to our dosing. And if you see here, the doses are very different depending on the pervasiveness of the psychosis. So with bipolar, our average dose, our median dose is 100 milligrams. And for people with schizophrenia spectrum disorder, it's 325. But you can see the dose ranges are tremendous. We have people with a true schizophrenia spectrum as low as 25 milligrams. And the same thing with um, bipolar down to 12 and a half milligrams. See, that's impossible, but that's what they needed to get a good outcome. And we go as high as 900 milligrams. Next slide. And the therapeutic levels also are all over the map, but you can see the difference. Again, with bipolar illness, we average just a little over 200, whereas with our schizophrenia spectrum, 639. But what I want to point out on this slide is if you look carefully, there's little lines, little connotations, and they're marked. The 47 is the low point of where we have someone. 416 represents the first quarter of patients. 639 is the median. 904 is represents three quarters. That means a quarter of our patients require 12-hour trough level between 900 
and 1,700. 1,700 is a bit of an outlier. Usually I'll stop below 1,500. Next slide. Let's talk a little bit about this because you really need to know. Clozapine is not an easy drug to use, but it's more effective and you get great outcomes, so it's worthwhile. But you need to know that you have to try to get people off the cigarette because cigarettes, it's the coal tar and it's the hydrocarbons that affect metabolism and they lower levels. Whereas caffeine gently increases levels. So it's important to keep it steady. There are certain drugs out there. For instance, someone tried to give one of my patients ciprofloxacin. That would have tripled their clozapine levels and could have led to seizures or worse. Serious illness. So lower respiratory tract infections. Pneumonia in the literature is reported with mortality of over 50%. We've lost no one from pneumonia because we're aware, but serious pneumonia with a lot of inflammation, you need to reduce the drug dose of clozapine because the inflammation itself slows down the clozapine metabolism. Next slide. Now we can use that same knowledge of the pathway to make clozapine a better drug and what we've done in fully 70% of our population is we use something called fluvoxamine. Fluvoxamine can take the ratio of clozapine to norclozapine, which at 12 hours is normally about 1.3. After we've added fluvoxamine, we're averaging 2.6. Why do we want to do that? Well, what do I fear most? I, feel, I fear pneumonia. And what when does that occur? It's usually aspiration at night. What drives that? Often the excess salivation. By using fluvoxamine, we're decreasing the metabolism of clozapine to norclozapine overnight. Therefore, the norclozapine level is lower and the siluria, the excess of salivation, is greatly reduced. But also, the fluvoxamine in itself seems to add up to an improved sedation, sleep time, and also has good effects on weight. The risk is when you get higher levels because it does block metabolism, it has seizures. So anytime I'm using fluvoxamine, I start exceedingly slowly, checking levels, come back, and I always have these people on anti-seizure prophylaxis. The other downside is because you're getting more clozapine to norclozapine, and if you remember, clozapine's anticholinergic, Norclozapine is cholinergic, the constipation could be worse, and so can the nausea. So you're going to need to treat that. Next slide. We're getting towards the end. So the clozapine, if I had a perfect clinic, I would have a psychiatrist or an NP or an internist or a neurologist, anyone who's adept at doing medicine and clozapine. And again, I would absolutely have someone doing cognitive uh, behavioral therapy and dialectic behavioral therapy. Social workers are also important because a lot of these people need case management and housing. And the legal interface, unfortunate, is way too often. Peer specialist, and we do have one of my patients when they come to the house kind of as my de facto peer specialist. She is a psychiatric social worker as well. And that's just wonderful because you want to see someone who has recovered and is out there in the community. And we befriend, we normalize, creating community. Can't emphasize it enough. Next slide. We, as we've already mentioned, we really push exercise and nutrition. Again, train people in LEAP. Again, job training, full supported therapeutic housing, substance abuse. Dogs do matter. If you come to my house one of these days, there's usually five or six dogs running around, and I can't tell you how much it matters to these people. So we try to take a full biopsychosocial model, and the goal is recovery, meaningful recovery. Next slide. What's made things easier, remember I kept alluding to that mandatory blood test? Well, there's now a point of care uh, test, and this is what's called the Atlas device, and it's a finger stick prick that you can do at home, so it minimizes the blood draws that you need to do. Next slide. And what do people say? It quieted my mind instead of deadening it. Kids on Cosbean look normal and act normal. I can't tell you that feeling where you can't tell who's on Cosbean when you come to one of my gatherings at my house. The kids look great. The lights are back on in their eyes, the awakening phenomena. Next slide. 
this is just uh, our Zoom session. These are the people that happened to be on that day that wanted to be on the, the picture. A few of them are probably here now. Next slide. These are the harsh realities. We've got to do a heck of a lot better. So it's a serious brain disease. 3% of the population is affected by psychotic disorder. The reality is clozapine should be used at a very minimal. If you're going to take the definition of resistant schizophrenia, the two were not achieving close to baseline values. We should have 40% or so of people on schiz uh, with schizophrenia or, or, or schizoaffective disorder on that. Right now, 50% of these kids get no treatment, and there's 4% in those that do, so it's 2%. In bipolar illness, it's less than 1%. We've got to do so much better. It's costing incredible heartache, 2% of our gross national product. It's a lifelong illness. It's one of the leading causes of disability, and it is. It's a neurologic disease that needs to be treated as such. We can do so much better. Next slide. I just want to show you this quickly. This is a girl out in Arizona. This is an artist. This is before she became ill. Next slide. Picture's worth a thousand words. Things aren't looking quite the same. The middle slide are pictures of dogs, believe it or not. I don't know what kind of fruit that is. And I believe that's a unicorn. And that's on a lanzapine. Next slide. Still sub-therapeutic, but a dog looks like a dog and a person looks like a person. She's coming back to reality. A picture's worth a thousand words. Next slide. These are indispensable. I'll be a little self-promoting. Uh, my book with Lou Opler, the late Lou Opler, my wife and my son, is very useful. It's not as well referenced as the Clausbean Handbook. There is a lot in common between the two. You need them both. Because especially, especially if you're going to be going to your psychiatrist, you want to have all the references. And the uh, Meyer Stahl book is better referenced than I, I have to admit that. Next slide. I just want you to have this next slide. These are some of the more important references that you can actually look up. A lot of these are available online. So you can just freeze these slides since this is a recorded session. Next slide. And this is how you get a hold of me. And I want you to take this down. There's all this information on our website. That's my email. That's my cell phone. And we are a community. So at this point, I will take questions. So I did take it almost to the very end. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Leitman. And I sped up because <laughs> I was running out of time. <laughs> you do have a lot to share and we hate to miss it. So that's why we let the lecture go on for uh, most of the time that we have here. We really only have a couple of minutes. There were a couple of questions. Um, early on, I saw one that said, can someone build a tolerance to clozapine after years of use or can it become less effective? You know, there's a, got, there's a lot of heterogeneity with these illnesses. And what is absolutely characteristic in other, uh, with use of other antipsychotics is that typical phenomenon of, yes, you get a good response initially, and then it wears off. So there is neurodegeneration, even with clozapine. And there's ongoing studies that are actually out of Mount Sinai University where they're following people yearly with functional MRIs and doing what's called gray matter, uh, really accurate scans of remaining uh, gray matter in the brains. So if you look, clozapine shows the least loss. It, in other words, the best retention of gray matter, but compared to normals, there is still some loss. So depending on where you start, what your genetic burden is, the disease may get so bad. And there are other things to do when clozapine fails, but that's also what you want to do is you want to look at levels. You may need to do more. And the one thing, especially when it's positive symptoms, you don't want to ever give up on this. First of all, when people have tried to use other antipsychotics, when clozapine fails, guess what the antipsychotic was when they were done? more common than not, over 70 some percent, it was clozapine. So clozapine remains the best in other settings. But what you can add is uh, electroconvulsive therapy. 
ECT is exceedingly useful and its mechanism is poorly understood, but it's thought to stimulate neurogenesis again. And that's part of also what happens with clozapine as well. So you can do that. There is something coming down the road called SAINT, smart, mm -hmm. augmented, um, no, what is it? Smart, augmented, intelligent neurostimulation. It's basically using a theta burst um, uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation, 10 treatments a day for five days. And they're using it now for depression, suicidality, and it is coming to you soon. They do with functional MRI. It is being investigated with psychotic illness and it may be useful. Those are the modalities. Um, outside of that, other people have tried to use other antipsychotics on top of it, including me. And I've had very limited success. If I use another antipsychotic, I will tend to use Abilify. But before that, I push levels of clozapine and I do these other tricks that I talked about. Hope that answered your question. <laughs> That's helpful. Yeah. Um, I think there's one last question. It really is 8.30 and we try to start and stop on time. Um, the question I would, would add right now is, um, what would you recommend as the best way to motivate uh, a patient's, a loved one's psychiatrist to try Clozeril? What do you think is the best argument that can be presented for that? Well, Clozeril is a name brand. And that, I'm yeah, just going to make a little aside. No, no, that's okay. Because actually there is a difference between the generics and Clozeril. So if you can get Clozeril, more power to you. At least you'll know you'll have the product. But if you do get a generic, try to stay with one because there's enough differences between the uh, clozapine preparations that it can cause a disruption in care. This is something we've become very aware about. There's not a lot of literature for. Um, how do you motivate a psychiatrist? Well, it was really, there's another survey saying, what drug would you use if your loved one became ill? So they are aware because what they said is they would use Clozeril. Mm. It's a lot of work. You show them the information. You hope that they care. You, in, you just got a pester. And if you know they won't do it, you find yourself another psychiatrist, mm. especially if you fall into that domain where you failed, your loved ones failed those two antipsychotics. We know if you've done that, the chances of having meaningful recovery with any of the other antipsychotics is dismally small. Are there exceptions? Of course there are exceptions. But when you're doing medicine, you do pattern recognition and you play the odds because you always are looking at population. So I'd much rather have a drug that'll give me a 70, 80% chance of success than one that's 1%. And show him, show him, bring him the clozapine handbook. And, you know, just turn, let me see if I remember the page. I think it's page 57, but it's right there. That's, uh, there it is. Um, it's, damn it, I don't have the page anymore. The efficacy story is basically, it's well known that if you fail these two drugs and you're trying something else, even an injectable, the odds are so poor that you're going to have a good outcome, you know, well less than 5%. You, you know, it's hard to deny that. Um, and again, if they really will refuse to listen, then you have to find someone that will listen to you. And again, it's, clozapine use is dependent on a community. The more clozapine that's used, in any community, the more that's used, period. Because once there's a familiarity in the community, mm -hmm. yeah, it gets you. And you know, Southern Connecticut is not bad because you guys have Silver Hill and Rocco Murata, who's been doing this longer than I have. And uh, you know, you have me, and the, there's, you know, there are some real clozapine champions in the area, so they could be found. Again. My wife and I, I'm gonna tell you this right now, can't take care of the world, but we do have some nurse practitioners, not affiliated with us, but that I've trained 
that are available to take new patients. And they're doctor nurses, so they're doctors, you know, DNPs. So look, there is help out there. And the idea is to train more and more people. But again, if you have a therapeutic relationship, a true therapeutic relationship with your psychiatrist, and your kid is not getting the recovery you should get, you just have to be nice, but press, but be willing to leave and find someone else. Okay. Well, we thank you very much for your time. I apologize to, there were a few questions in the chat that we really didn't get around to. Um, you can send those to me. And well, if we, they have emails, uh, you know, I can get back to them. That's what I've done in past chats. Okay, I think we could do that. Uh, one is an interesting question for the whole crowd. Any chance of an injectable clozapine coming along? You've talked about clozapine. There is injectable. an injectable clozapine and any billionaires in the crowd, um, this would be one of my projects. It's made in uh, the Netherlands. Um, I, um, it's, it's under small aliquots. Um, it's available in England. Um, obviously the Netherlands, some of the, uh, Finland as well, and Israel, um, somewhat in France with a few practitioners. Uh, Rebecca Henry has a study where she was able to give clozapine injectable for 134 straight days. The problem is there's no long acting injectable and I'm, I've, oh, that's what I meant. Two. Yeah. Yeah. And there is no, there is no long acting injectable and that's the push. And a lot of that comes back to the fear of yeah. the neutropenia. They're afraid mm -hmm. that if they do it, but you know, if you look at the data, it's a, such an unjustified fear. The other problem is it's a highly charged molecule and the amount of fluid that you need mm -hmm. for a long acting injectable so far has been too much. So there's problems in the preparation and, and two, they really, they have not spent a lot of time doing this because there's all sorts of way of getting a long acting preparation. You don't need necessarily an injectable. They used to have the things that they would implant underneath the skin mm -hmm. or birth control. There, there's a, a wax matrix. There are all sorts of devices, but there's not been a lot of time or effort devoted to it. And yes, that would be, yes, the gold standard mm -hmm. would be a long acting injectable clasp. And it's my dream. Yes, very important. And something that's always in the back of my mind, as I said, find me a billionaire. I will fly right now to the Netherlands. I'll get that. And we'll, we'll start ourselves on a nonprofit pharmaceutical company. Well, thank you very much for all of your dreams and hopes that you've shared with us tonight. It's very motivating and comforting to, to, to a good number of families. And, and again, don't be afraid to call or text is better. I really try to make myself available to people. Again, we're not taking new patients per se. So I'm not looking for, <laughs> but I'll help. I can help. And again, you, we can always enter you on our Zoom calls. And I think people find that fairly useful. And sometimes we actually influence psychiatrists along the way. Sometimes they're starting to talk to us now. Sounds Already? great. It's well, we really fun. appreciate you talking to us. So thank you very much. I, it's been a pleasure, guys. Good to see everyone here. Take care. Nice to see you. Thank you. Hello, gang. Oh, my God. Still name. Hi, Maury. <laughs> Hi, Barbara. Oh, my God. A lot of mine. But a lot I don't recognize as well. Let's see who's here. Yeah, we had about 135 people. So there were a lot. We, we, over, we had and Lynn. Hi, Lynn again. We had over half of uh, the registered. That's pretty good. I'll take that anytime. 